please find Paul's letter to Titus. This is now my third sermon in Titus 2, 11 through 15. If you're in Titus 2, go ahead and join me in standing. I want to read to you the Holy Word of God. Hear now the words of our holy, wise, loving, and sovereign God. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. And thus ends the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Thanks be unto God for his word. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would cause the Holy Spirit to write these truths upon our hearts this morning. May he engrave them upon our souls. May they be stamped with this precious truth that we would, we would know you, that we would know you as you have revealed yourself, as you are in reality that we would love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves as Christ has so generously and sacrificially loved us. That we would remember what Christ, our Savior, your holy and eternal Son has done for us. Teach us with your word this morning, O Lord. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, let me give you a brief, I say brief, but then, you know, a brief reminder about the context. So Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, as you know, Paul introduces himself, he gives us some details about his ministry, and then he greets Titus with a Trinitarian gospel, the good news as it is in the Father and the Son, and the gift being the Holy Spirit. And then in verses 5 to the end of the chapter, at the end of chapter 1, we have in this section of Scripture where Paul, he's reminding Titus, why is it that he, Titus, was left in Crete? Well, he was left in Crete for a few things. And the first thing being that he would appoint overseers or elders or a more common term around, you know, our area, pastors. The Lord was going to not just draw men and women to himself by grace and give them faith in Christ and save them, but out of those men that he has saved, he would then equip and raise up qualified men who could shepherd the people of God with the word of God. And it was Titus' job to say, there was one over there, and there was one over there. And this one right here, look what the Lord has called him to. The second thing that Paul reminds Titus of is that he must combat false teachers. He is to oppose them. He is to silence or muzzle them. He is to, he has a ministry not just towards those who are called to the pastorate, in Crete, 
Titus also has a ministry toward those who are false teachers and those who believe in false teachings. And that's basically chapter 1 of Titus. Now in chapter 2 of Titus, verses 1 through 10, Paul then is beginning to emphasize Titus' ministry to the Christians in general in Crete. And he's really stressing that Titus is to teach what accords with sound doctrine, to help the Christians there learn how to live distinctly Christian lives, that they would possess and they would practice Christian virtues and qualities. And Paul, he walks through different groups of people that Titus is going to minister to in Crete, the older men, the older women, the younger women, the younger men, and slaves. And he's to help them think about how they are to live for the glory of the Lord, how they ought to, with their lives, adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. And then that brings us to our text this morning, Titus 2, verses 11 through 15. And sermon part one was over verse 11. What has appeared? Well, the grace of God has appeared. And what did it bring with it? Well, bringing salvation for all people. This is the saving grace of God. This grace saves sinners. But not only did this grace appear to bring salvation for all sorts of people, this grace also appeared to bring training to God's people. To train them to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions training them to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for their blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this saving grace of God is sanctifying. And something that we looked at and we paid close attention to is that this appearance of God's grace, just like the appearance of God's glory, is none other than the appearance of the Son of God in human flesh. Jesus is the grace of God in human flesh. Jesus is the glory of God in human flesh. And now that brings us right to verses 14 and 15, which we're going to really look at this morning. Now, let me just give you the three questions that I believe that these two verses, by and large, they they give priority to answering these three questions. Let me point out the questions to you. What did Jesus do? That's the first question. What did Jesus do? Second, why did Jesus do it? And third, what are we to do with this? So what did he do? Why did he do it? And what are we to do with this? So what did Jesus do? Titus 2, verse 14, who gave himself for us, who gave himself for us. I'm going to say out loud a question that I'm not expecting or necessarily wanting a, um, a verbal response. So here's the question. Think about it in your minds. Who is the who in verse 14? Is it not Jesus Christ? who was just mentioned in the last part of verse 13? Right? This is definitely, the who here is Jesus. The who here is our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He it was who gave himself for us. Now what does this language point out to us? What does it mean for Jesus to give himself for us? What is he giving? What is he doing? I believe that Jesus gave himself as a substitute for us? I think that's the answer. If you have a bulletin under the first question, I have written out an answer with a blank in it, and that blank should be filled with substitute. Jesus gave himself as a substitute for us. Now, what do I mean by substitute? Let me see if I can give you some illustrations. Well, think of Genesis 27. Think about how Jacob substituted himself in the place of Esau to get his blessing, to get a blessing from his dad, Isaac. 
You remember this? Remember how the scheme was thought up about, it was actually brought up by Jacob's mom. And Jacob was like, okay, I'm kind of scared to do this, mom. And she says, well, if it goes wrong, let that land on me. But nonetheless, he dressed up, Jacob dressed up to smell like and feel like Esau, to deceive Isaac in order to get the blessing. That's a substitute. But think, think about Jesus' substitution in comparison to Jacob's substitution. Jesus did not dress up like us to steal our blessing. No, Jesus dressed up like us to earn our blessing and to take our curse. He's the greater Jacob. He's the better Jacob. He dressed up like us, not to take something that's really good away from us, away from us but to take something from us that's really horrible that we don't want. The curse, sin and death, the penalty and punishment of our evil. He dressed up to do that for us. Not to deceive, but to reveal. Not to steal blessings, but to earn them and give them and take our curse. When I think of substitution, I often think of David and Absalom. Second Samuel. Absalom did some pretty treacherous things to his dad, David, who was king. He betrayed him. He turned the hearts of the people against his father and toward himself. David had to flee from the town, from Jerusalem. And then Absalom, under some bad advice, he tried to hunt down his father to put him to death. But things turned for the good of David, and Joab and those who were with him put Absalom to death. And in 2 Samuel 18, verse 33, when David receives the news from these messengers that are sent by Joab, he hears that his enemies have been defeated by the Lord, knowing that the young man Absalom has not survived. And David goes to the the roof chamber of the gate, and he weeps. And what does he say? He says, oh, my son Absalom, my son Absalom, would I not have died instead of you? Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. What's David wanting? He's wanting to be a substitute for Absalom. Though Absalom has betrayed him and done horrible evil toward him, he wants to be a substitute. He wants to take Absalom's death so that Absalom wouldn't have to die. Well, look around, my friends. We are surrounded among us with worse Absaloms. We have done a far worse thing toward the Lord our God, our Creator. And he didn't just wish he could be a substitute. He didn't just wish, I wish I could die instead of you. He came and did it, my friends. He was an effective substitute. He is the greater, the ultimate, the better David. And he substituted himself for a worse Absalom. And he actually died for us. Jesus is, in fact, a substitute. He gave himself for us. Take some time and think about Jesus' value and importance the one who substituted himself, the one who gave himself. Would you say that we are equals to him? I hope not. We're, no, we're nowhere near the importance and value of the Lord our God. This is who came and gave himself for us. Not an equal, but someone who is infinitely transcendent to us in importance and value. Right? Our value, our assigned value from God is just above, just a little bit above sparrows and grass. And yet, Jesus, our great God and Savior, gave himself for us. The grace of God in human flesh gave himself for us. The glory of God gave himself for us. As Jesus says in John 10, 12, 
I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. John 10, 17 and 18. This is why my father loves me, because I lay down my life. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. I've received this from my father. We learn in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, for there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Do you hear that? Jesus, how did he give himself? He laid his life down. The good shepherd laid his life down for his sheep. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, our mediator, the one who can only uniquely stand between us and God because he is us and he is God, he gave himself as a ransom for us. I think of Hebrews 9. My memory is failing me. Hebrews 9 says this, though. It says in 9.26, Listen to what the Word of God says. This is halfway through the verse. He, referring to Jesus, has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. By the sacrifice of himself. Is that not wonderful? My friends, in Galatians 1.4, it says, who gave himself for sin to deliver us from this present evil age. Everywhere you look in the scriptures and you're f- trying to find what, if, what did Jesus, what does it mean for him to give himself? It always revolves around his suffering, death, and crucifixion. He sacrificed himself. He was a substitute unto death for us. The one who purchased our salvation, he himself is the price of our salvation. What wonder of wonders. Jesus, who is truly God, fully God and fully man, he gave himself for us. Through his human nature, he offered a sacrifice. Through his divine nature, he was the altar. That was the altar that sanctified the sacrifice. Isn't it wonderful? And my friends, now let's turn our attention away from the one who gave himself to the us that he gave himself for. We already have already discussed we're not as equal. We're a little, a little more in value than sparrows and grass. But not just that. Did Jesus die for good people? He did not. He died for people who, they are above value when it comes to the sparrow's value and the grass's value. But even that, these are rebels. The grass never rebelled against God. Sparrows never sinned against the Lord. Romans 3, 10 through 12, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. They have all turned aside. Together they become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Romans 8, 7 through 8. For the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. It's at enmity. It is strictly opposed to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. For those in the flesh cannot please God. Not only did Jesus lay himself down for creatures not as equal... And rebel creatures are that, but rebel creatures that are in such rebellion that they can't escape their own rebellion. They cannot even please him. He came to rescue helpless sinners. Romans 7, 14, Paul says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm of the flesh, sold under sin. Romans 7, 18, I'm sure, I know that nothing good dwells in me. Paul, the Apostle Paul, I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. 
Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. It speaks of us at the end of verse 3 as being by nature children of wrath as the rest of mankind. We are by nature those who provoke God's holy wrath. This is who Jesus gave himself for. Their very nature incites God's wrath against them. My friends, I hope what's ringing in your ears and in your heart right now is, though this is a simple truth, and you maybe have received it years and years past, maybe you, you should be refreshed at how marvelous this is, that Jesus gave himself for us. Just look and ponder at his substitutionary sacrifice. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the prince of life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood, who his love will not remember? Who, will, who can cease to sing his praise? He will never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. On the mount of crucifixion, floodgates, fountains opened deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love, like mighty rivers, poured incessant from above. Heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. This is a marvelous truth that you must understand. He gave himself for us as a better David, as a far greater Jacob, and he saved people who are far worse than, those, than the Absalom mentioned in 2 Samuel 18. This is wonderful, my friends. Now, why did he do it? Why did he do it? What was the result he was going after? Well, it says in the text, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who were zealous for good works. Why did he do this? Why did Jesus give himself as a substitute for us? Jesus gave himself to free us and to clean us. That's why. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that it might bring us to God, reconcile us back to God. Now what is 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 say. Now this is a marvelous text. Just so happens I can't remember exactly what it says. What does it say? Knowing that you were ransomed. There's that ransom language again. You were ransomed. You were purchased from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He ransomed us from the futile ways that we inherited from our forefathers. Isn't that amazing? 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. If you were listening closely, you heard that we become righteous in, a, in the same way that Jesus becomes sinful. Well, we know Jesus didn't become sinful because he did sin. No, he did not sin. He was tempted in every way, yet without sin. Jesus did not commit in thought, word, or deed, or desire, sin, or evil. So how is it that the text says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake 
he made him to be sin. Because our sin was credited and counted to him, to his account. That's how. And in the same way, we become righteous. Not because we commit righteous deeds. No, 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 no. We do not become righteous because we do righteousness. We become righteous because we are attributed, we are credited Jesus' righteousness. It's the great exchange. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Makes you think of Genesis 15, 6. And he believed and it was counted to him for righteousness. God gives the gift of righteousness to Abraham by giving Abraham the gift of faith. Through faith, I will bring my righteousness to you, my saving righteousness to you. It's wonderful. This is what has happened. We've been set free. We've been redeemed. We've been ransomed. Well, well, the bondage and slavery that we were in, when it comes to the penalty of our sin, Jesus came with the key. He came and opened up hell's doors and heaven's gates for us. He freed us, freeing us from the condemnation of sin. Isn't that wonderful? But not only did Jesus give himself to free us, he gave himself also to cleanse or to clean us. Didn't he? I believe that's what it means when he says purify. I think of Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to sanctify her for himself. To remove her spots and her wrinkles and her blemishes that she would stand blameless before him. A, a chaste, holy bride. He washes us with his word. What should come to mind is Revelation 7, verses 13 through 14, where there is these people in white robes, and how, are, how did they make their robes so white? Well, they washed it in the blood of the Lamb. They've been washed by his blood, by his atoning sacrifice. And notice how it says, we've been purified, we've been cleansed for himself, a people for his own possession, who were zealous for good works. Ah, you would say, there it is. That's why he wanted to save us, because we're zealous for good works. He saved us because he knew we're trying to do good works, and we, we actually were successful with a couple of them. No? Just turn your eye down to Titus 3, verse 3. Let's begin reading from there. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, Slave to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness. Not because of that. Nope. But according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, not our works or, or, or the zealousness for good works. We've been justified by his grace. We might become heirs, inheritors, according to the hope of eternal life. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. Why is that? We're God's workmanship. Why does it say God's workmanship? It doesn't say our workmanship, because we didn't do the work, right? We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. My friends, we were not saved as a result of our good works or being zealous for good works. We were saved for them, to go and do them. 
We're not saved because we're zealous for good works. We are zealous for good works because we are saved by grace. Do you believe that? Has the grace of God, the justifying grace of God in Christ, has it freed you from the penalty of sin, and has it cleansed you? Has it cleansed, has it purified you? So that you have a desire for good works, and you're able to do good works for the glory of the Lord who saved you. That's what this verse is saying. So what did Jesus do? He gave himself as a substitute for us. Why did he do it? Well, Jesus gave himself to free us and to clean us. Now, what are we to do with this? Well, look at verse 15. Paul tells Titus, Declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Notice how Paul does not tell Titus, you need to embrace these things, because Titus already has embraced these things. So, Titus, you, you know what I'm talking about. You know the good news. You've trusted in Christ. Do this, which is speak. We are to speak of these, of these things with steady determination. We're to insist upon these things. We're to open our mouths and talk to our families about it. We're to open our mouths and we're to talk with authority to our, our friends, those we see at work from week to week. You know, the, our neighbors in our neighborhood, the, pity, the, 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 the people that live in the city that we live in, we ought to with authority talk to them. And notice how it says, Right, speak with authority. Man, that, that makes me think about what Jesus says in the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, where Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. It makes you think about how Paul spoke to those in the Areopagus in Acts 17. He spoke with authority. Remember, Acts 17, I believe it's 29 through 31, Paul just got done saying, you know, you already believe that we are, cre we are creatures made by God. So if in that sense, we are his offspring if he, right, if he bore us up, if he created us. And if we're not like statues of stone and precious metal, why would you then assume that the one who created you is? That doesn't make any sense. Nonetheless, the Lord has overlooked these times of ignorance, but now God commands all men everywhere to repent. Does that sound authoritative to you? God commands all men everywhere to repent. You need to look to Christ and trust in him. Because he's appointed a day of judgment, and the judge will be the one he raised from the dead. The one who he raised from the dead, he's the Savior. But if you refuse him, he will be your judge. And he's uniquely qualified to be your judge because he came, and he lived, and he died, and he rose again. And he is qualified, because of his resurrection from the dead, to judge you. Does that sound authoritative to you? It makes me think about John Knox. He was told not to come to Scotland, specifically to St. Andrews, and to their cathedral, and preach. He was told by the authorities there, if you come and teach here, you will be greeted with a six-man salute. <laughs> and the greater, which would be, it'll be blighted upon your nose, meaning we're going to shoot you in the face if you come here. And he came anyways, and they received him, and he assumed the center. He went there, and he acted like he belonged there. This is a church of God, is it not? Oh, I have a word from God that you need to hear. That's, what, that's, that's what's meant here when Paul tells Titus, declare these things. 
exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Speak in a way that I have, I have crown rights from my king to tell you this news. And this news is binding upon you. You must hear it and you must respond. Here's the response that would delight my king. Repent and believe. We are to insist upon these things. We ought to have a steady, dare I say, stubborn determination to speak about these things. My friends, I have a couple of applications for you, and they're just scripture passages. The first one being Romans 8. Romans 8, verses 31 through 39. Keep in mind, what did Jesus do? Why did he do it? What are we to do with this? I think Romans 8, 31 through 39 is a very appropriate response to what Jesus has done and why he did it and what we are to do. Romans 8, 31, starting from there. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can effectively and successfully be against us if God Almighty is for us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, O Lord, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Listen to the sureness of the apostle as he speaks by the Spirit. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth. And here is the most universal you can get in language. Nor anything else in all creation. Am I part of creation? Yep, I'll, I've been created, and I happen to live on God, in God's world. What about you? What about you, Derek? Are you, are you part of God's creation? You are. Not even Derek can get in the way of this, guys, as strong as he is. Not even I could get in the way of this. Nothing in all of God's creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing. This kind of begs the question, what are we scared about? Why do, we have, why do we think we have reasons to fear? They can do their worst, and it only serves our good. It doesn't touch our inheritance. It does nothing to our salvation, which is secure, kept in heaven for us, guarded by faith. My friends, we should thank if Christ gave himself, why would I doubt that he'd give anything less than himself? When you're praying, do you think, well, you gave me yourself, Jesus, but you may in fact leave me starving on the road to heaven. If he's provided himself the ultimate gift, do you really think that you have reason to doubt he'll give any lesser gift for you? I mean, if you have the major, you will not be denied the minor. Right? If you have the greater gift, Christ, how can you or I think as if, yeah, but the lesser I might be denied? These verses teach otherwise. I believe it was Spurgeon who said, if a man jumps into water, into a pond to save a drowning child, and then brings him out, and then that man happened to have a piece of bread in his pocket and the child need it. Do you think that the man who just 
basically gave his life to rescue this little child, would then say, no, not the bread. Not the bread. Why do we think so of God? You've just heard Titus 2, 14 and 15. You've just heard Romans 8, 31 to 39. May we not act so cowardly and so unbelieving. Our God is a good God, and he is sovereign. He's already provided the ultimate gift in Christ. What makes us think that he won't also freely, graciously give us all things for our good and his glory? Believer, I pray that you are challenged by Romans 8, 31 through 39, as you ponder the points that I try to extract and put before you in Titus 2, verses 14 and 15. I believe it was Spurgeon again who said, if we were able to somehow siphon all of the value of mankind from all generations of all history, to siphon it and mint it and put it into a coin, and then offer that coin to the Lord, would that even buy a single tear of the Redeemer? It wouldn't. We take all of our collective value and importance, and we couldn't even buy, we couldn't even purchase a tear from Jesus. It is by grace he gave himself for us. It is not by works. If he saved us by grace, he will keep us by his grace. And we should, have, we should be encouraged by this grace to be fearless. Now, that time where I, back in verse 15, how I kind of made a big deal about how Titus wasn't instructed. You need to embrace this because he's a believer. Now, if, you, if there are unbelievers among us, I think there might be, keep in mind that Titus 2.15 is not instructions for you. You must first receive the gospel before you start insisting others to hear it. You must first trust in Jesus before you rebuke with all authority. The verse that came to mind for you all would be Isaiah 45, verse 22. Turn to me, be saved, all the ends of the earth. I am God and there is no other. And I can't help when I think of that verse, when I think about its simple command to turn, ancient translations would say to look. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the earth. I can't help to think about Spurgeon's conversion. Because that was the verse that was preached. He was in a snowstorm. He didn't happen to go to the service he wanted to go to, so he just kind of, uh, he said, I can't get there, so I'm going to go to this other service. I'm not really looking forward to it but I'll go there. And he goes, and even the preacher who was appointed to preach that day wasn't there. And this thin, thinly old man gets up there, and he gives a 10-minute sermon to 12 people. <laughs> and he does not stray from his text. And it's Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. Look, he said. Spurgeon said he even pronounced the words rightly. But nonetheless, he kept shouting, Look, you don't need to go to college to look, and then Spurgeon said, he actually pointed me out as the stranger and said, you have a miserable look about you, son, and you'll be miserable indeed in life and in death if you don't look at Christ. If you were to look this very moment, you would be saved. Look and live, young man. And Spurgeon said, I wasn't used to people making remarks from the pulpit about my appearance, but nonetheless, it was a good struck, it was a good blow that was struck to me. I came there, I was ready to do 50 things to get saved. And he just said, look. And I looked, and I looked, and I looked at Christ. I looked, and I could have looked my eyes out, he said. And that word became a, a precious word to me. I looked at Christ by faith, and the darkness seemed to flee. So unbeliever, look unto Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that your Son gave himself for us. That he is our substitute, that he represents us before you. For he is perfect in life and death and resurrection. And that he gave himself to free us and to 
clean us. May those who are on the fence about Jesus look to him and trust. And to get off that fence by repentance, turning to the Lord and coming to him by faith.